Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome onto the stage to sing In Your Eyes, in your eyes from, the, from the hit album of the same show, the star creator of Metrosexuality, Mr. Ricky Beagle Blair. Kiss and sticky, louder, dress this way. I'm backstage at the Talk of London, the plush night spot. Um, getting ready to do a performance piece, do a number from our album basically. I'm going to do it in your eyes, there is God. In your eyes, there is God, Be body painted as um, I'm going to go do an art uh, creation, uh, creation of the world motif, the Garden of Eden thing. And I'm going to be painted one side as the night on this side, and on the back, I'm going to be a sunrise. In your eyes. Everything I do is very important to me. And um, so metrosexuality is no exception. Uh, this one really, this project really focuses on um, the part of my life that, that um, it's kind of one of the oldest parts really, how I was brought up, being brought up by a lesbian mum is really important to me because, because it's, so, um, it's so marginalised in the world, it's ignored or when you do see it, it's on, growing up you see all these chat shows where people are sitting around talking about your life and the fact that your parent is unfit and that you are being destroyed by your parents so I wanted to show that that's not the case you are being destroyed by your parent but only the same way as everybody else is we're parents we need running and screaming and assessing questions and Spice Girls records our life is loud our life is full of life this nothing it was a role which you know I played hopefully to the best of my ability um, I suppose obviously I would have used the influences of my mum as part of it, but I didn't sort of, you know, I didn't sort of go and explore it more. I just sort of, you know, all the influences that I already had. I introduced her as I did all my friends, as a friend, and to see how the children would respond and take to her, because for me it was important, whatever the friendship, intimate or platonic, that they were embraced by my children, so. I didn't have a different way of doing it to how I would do it with anybody that they'd never met before. Bye now, gay later. I can't keep up. You are so 20th century, you know that. Mind you, you're only being gay to spite me. People always think that coming out to your parents is easier if they're gay and you're gay, but that's not true at all. Because the, it's actually very irritating because the last thing you want to do is be exactly like your parents. So, and also your parents, it's just the same if you're straight and you have to tell your parents that you've had sex, that's not easy, is it? That um, you want to keep that to yourself. You don't. You might say you're going on a date or something. That's easier. That part of it is easier. But um, talking about your sex life and your sexuality and how you feel and what your anxieties are and all, that's not easy. And it's a similar kind of thing. With um, and if your parents are gay and you are gay, then you just think this is so boring. I don't want to be like them. I don't want them to give me advice and I know they're going to think they've got special advice to give me. I don't want to hear that. So it actually becomes just as um, complicated, the whole thing of coming out to them, because, it's kind of, it's because, um, because you know that they're going to feel even more um, responsible for giving you good advice, and that's not you know, what you want at all. And they're going to see it in terms of their sexuality. And of course, in terms of being gay, it changes so quickly at the moment over the decades, you know, it's changing so much the attitudes towards it. The attitudes of somebody who's brought up in the 50s, which is my mother, and, or, and what, you know, had reached adolescence in the 50s and the early 60s, what she feels about her sexuality is so different to what I feel coming to my sexuality in the 70s and 80s. It's just a totally different attitude towards yourself. So, you know, so it, it was, there was like a big chasm between us. So as you grow older, as we know, the difference, age difference means less and less as you grow older. So now we can talk much more about these things than we could when I was you know, a teenager. A teacher did ask me that when he was quite young, how did I feel about that? And my response was immediate, without having given any thought, was that it really didn't matter that he was my son and I loved him. And, and I think that's what it was. It's, that's my son and I love him regardless, whatever, whoever, whatever, you know. Um, 
So yes, I never had to sit and think about it. He just grew as a child and into an adult. And that's, um, the emphasis wasn't for me on that. My, his emphasis was him fulfilling his potential. That was where my thoughts were. Like when I was six or seven, and you have crushes on girls and boys, and it's just the same to you. And um, and that you quickly learn that one is allowed and one is not. Me and my friends have big arguments about this, whether um, sexuality is genetic, or you know whether art is genetic, whether crim being a criminal is genetic, whether being um, uh, a sportsman is genetic. I don't. I don't even. I can't even pretend to understand it. All I know is that the answers that are given to me don't cover it. You know, it's, and in a way, that's why I create art because I don't have the answer. Because if I had the answer, I would just give it to you. Art is my way of saying, let's look at the questions, and let's question the questions. I had a distinctive voice for somebody from Bermondsey. You know, in Bermondsey, everyone talks like that, mate. You talk like that, and I didn't talk like that. So I got a lot of, um, I got a lot of comments were passed a lot about it. But the, uh, but that's just the way I talked. Because of his artistic and creative way of using words, I think that combined with the influence um, made it easy probably for him to, to develop um, the way in which he speaks because he's always been um, quite, um, art well, extremely articulate from a very early age and his use of the English, la English language um, has always been beyond his years. I remember there was one boy who got obsessed with the way I spoke and he used to follow me home from school every day and he'd be saying, so he, and, and he was just always trying to pick a fight with me and then one day I snapped and shoved him and he went over a car bonnet and he was so shocked he just ran off and he never bothered me again. And you know, you could get, got into fights and you did, yeah, we did get attacked, there was a lot of things like that but I think all kids get that. I went to a primary school and junior school and all of those things. When I got to secondary school, my mum let me go to a, a free school where I could learn anything I wanted. What makes this play particularly unusual is not so much its enthusiasm, although there's obviously plenty of that, but the fact that it's been written, directed, produced and stage managed by a schoolboy of 12. He's called Ricky, he doesn't go to school anymore, and none of his actors go to school either. My main thing was writing plays, putting them on. And so we would do everything. I'd make the costumes, you know, I'd set it up. You essentially produced it. The Bermondsey Lampost School, as it's called, is run by Lois Acton, a former head of geography in the local comprehensive school. She was so worried about the way many children were missing their chances at school, particularly with those with broken homes, that she decided to resign and help them herself outside the system altogether. Ricky wanted to direct. When I said to him, list the things that you want to do in order of what do you think you enjoy doing and what you'd really like to do. And he wanted to write and he wanted to direct. So we said, fine, that's what you're going to do. That's, you do that. And he had this book. He always had this rectangular book. I've still got pages, which probably Ricky doesn't know. But he would be writing scripts or writing notes. And he always wanted to direct as well. So we built a theatre on the street corner made of pallets of wood, old bits of tin. It had a couple of armchairs on the stage, which somebody had chucked out. We had a field telephone, so you could actually get the ring-ring effect. Um, somebody could wind it up sort of off stage and, and it would ring. So we started doing plays there, and of course Ricky wanted to direct them, and he wanted to be involved with putting those plays together. That's what I think education's about. It's not about saying, this is school and this is life. School is life. <laughs> yes, yes, it's, it's, uh, my friends and I used to say, he danced like a white boy, yes. English and specifically at that time. I could always dance, but I didn't dance. Apparently, I, when I was a kid, I was, my mum used to laugh because she said I danced in a bit like an English boy and not like a Jamaican boy. And I, that made me very self-conscious about dancing in front of people until I was about 15 or 16. So actually I came to dancing publicly quite late, though I would do it in the shows. I didn't really, I'd keep that quite low profile. And then in my mid-teens I became less inhibited about it because she was a really good dancer and that, 
and I, I was too English my style, but apparently it's not now. But I always think that if I dance with, I have to do really funky routines, I always think, oh God, I'm not really that funky. And uh, which is silly because, uh, you know, I literally choreograph them. And if walking around Notting Hill, there's amazing people everywhere and they dress in very expressive ways and, and um, they, you know, the hip hop thing is there and the rock music thing is there and the junkies are there and, the, you know, there's always, there, there are always the people that look quite inspiring and, and quite surprising. This is Radio We 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 going out to all of you stay at home groovers, smoothers, and boogaloo babes. You need to step on the good foot and creep into the parlor, pick up your papa's car keys and take the right ride downtown. Into the heat, into the heat of the street, into the heart of Saturday night. <laughs> That's right. You need to just So it was like putting a fashion collection. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a statement that we're making, which is, wear what you want, be free. I mean, you know, you sort of think, oh, God, it'd be nice if you just wearing a pair of jeans and a jumper, but not to the extent that I wanted him to be wearing a pair of jeans and a jumper. If he wanted to be wearing his leggings, you know, then, you know, say beer, even if they were leopard skin. He's one of them people that, you know, sort of takes care of you, sort, sort of mothers you, but lets you do your own thing, lets you be independent, but always seems to be looking out for you, whether he realises he is or not. And I suppose uh, he's kind of motherly, but I've got a mother, so, you know, he's like definitely like a father figure to me. When I need advice, I ask him, you know, you know, when it comes to acting, I get offered roles or, or do auditions and certain things. I'd always ask him first. Noel really came to me. I was, I teach aerobics all the time, and and uh, he worked in this gym. He was a gym instructor at this gym. Um, and he asked me about this project and he asked me if he could audition for it. Simple as that. And, and I said, well, you look a bit too old for it. And he said, oh no, if I shave off my little goatee and uh, I look really, really young. Um, I said, well, I'd do it. And come to audition and like everybody else. And he did. And he was the first person to audition and he blew everybody away. Since the series has come out, I've had mostly positive reactions, you know, all my friends that, you know, they're still my friends from when they did the pilot, so by now they, they know about, they knew about the series a year, or year and a half before it even happened. Um, a lot of black people I've met have had all positive reactions. I've had, I've had a couple of negative reactions, but they haven't been from any, uh, any particular race. It was just some youths in the street, you know. He said, oh, you, you was in that Batty Man program, innit? And I was like, are you talking to me, mate? He said, yeah, you was in that Batty Man program, are you gay? I said, actually, yeah, you know, I'm not, but it's not that it's any of your business. And he said, you are, you are, you was in that program. You know, what's he asking me for if he thinks I am? And then I, I, I insulted him back in a rather rude manner, which I won't, I won't say on camera, but, but uh, yeah, so, no, I've had mostly positive reactions. People, like, see me in the street, you know, Kwame, Kwame, yes, I like that program there, it was all right, and all them things there. Right now, I'm off to Kensington Sports Centre, where I teach a class aerobics every day, uh, except Saturday. I'm going to try and make sad people happy, and happy people even happier, and fit people even fitter, and unfit people fit. If I can ever get out of this road. Love, love. 